All right, so we are recording. The screen is good, sound is good, and I just need to move the right screen onto the monitor. Okay, there we go. And there we go. All right. So I'm going to turn off the stage light. There we go. And turn up everything else. All right. So today's going to be a interesting lecture. I think uh, it's going to be a really good one. It's going to be pivotal for a few things. Um, the outline I have already, you know, put it into the announcement. I've also give, given you guys the exam from last semester, so that's also in one of the announcements. So we might be able to get to the exam. So we'll just go ahead and say the uh, the second exam or exam two is next to uh, Thursday. <clears throat> All right. So that's typically you know, one week you know, after I talk about the exam from the previous semester. I can start on it today, but I don't think I can finish it today. So we'll just assume that we'll finish it on Thursday. So that's why your exam too is going to be the Thursday after we do the practice, which is next Thursday. <clears throat> which according to my watch is uh, 4 plus 7 is 11, so April 11th is the second exam. So is there, are there any questions about the exam date? Yes. Yes. Why? The final exam, did you read the syllabus? The final exam is 40% of your grade. The second exam is 20%. I just spread my grade. Hmm? Oh, the, second, the second exam can lift it too, right? It can go in either direction. <clears throat> All right. So what I'm about to show you is the tool that I call River Spider. I have to re-upload this tool so that you can you have access to it. Um, so what you see here is ultra slow because you know this is actually in a virtual machine, but you don't have to use a virtual machine. So what you need to do if you want to use this tool, you don't have to use it today, by the way. Today's lab does not require the use of River Spider, even though if you want to try it out, you're welcome to. <clears throat> if you want to try out the you know, River Spider, there are, um, there's one thing you really need. You need a thumb drive, okay? So you know, make sure that you have a thumb drive that has about 1.5 gigs of space left. It is a little bit bloated. You know, it takes up that much space. But I do want to show you how it works, okay? Uh, because it can save you a lot of time. So once you set it up, okay, what you can do is to um, edit a particular you know, source file. So I have one right here. You know, syntax highlighting is not enabled, so it looks kind of boring. <clears throat> so this is a sample program. We'll talk about you know, programming and tracing in today's lecture a little bit. So don't worry about the meaning of this particular program. It is just a program written in TTP ASM. <clears throat> so what you do want to focus on is how easy it is to run it and have the trace uh, already uploaded to uh, the Google Sheet. So all you have to do is to dot slash submit dot sh and then follow by the name of the source code press the enter key and watch the magic happens. So it would automatically send the source file to the assembler, which is actually still on Google Sheet. It will download the object code, you know, put it into RAM, and it will run LogicSim you know, on the command line. And then once it's done, it will submit the trace data back to the uh, Google Sheet. And then when you get when you get to the Google Sheet, you will actually get, see the trace result. Yes. Not necessarily. You can put your files anywhere you want. Uh, it's just that when you specify the source file, then you have to kind of give it the name, like the the proper path to where you want to put it. So if you put a if you make a subfolder under Rifa Spider, then you can say you know uh, homework. 
slash you know something. So you can you can still use relative path to specify you know, where to find the source file. So it's it's kind of flexible, you know, in terms of what you can do with it. Um, does that does that answer the question? <clears throat> yeah. If you put it somewhere other than you know where the uh, this file is, um, I might need to adjust the script a little bit. But you know, so this is what you do. You know, once you have River Spider installed. And before I forget, I need to uh, re-upload this. Okay, so. So don't worry about all of this stuff here. You know, I will. I think there's a video showing you how to do this already. I'll, I'll point you to the resource. Uh, but what I do need to do right now is to <clears throat> um, destroy the two files that you don't that I don't want to share with you <laughs> because these two files are specific to a particular assembler. So I don't want you know everybody else to be uploading to the assembler that I use in class, you know, so it get all messed up you know, when people want to test the program. So I'm destroying those two files, and then I can re-upload this. Um, let me get out of here first. Okay. So the code or the um, this particular resource is called Rifa Spider, but it's running under SigWin. This is specific to Windows. If you have a Mac or Linux, then you use the quote unquote usual version. This version is only for people using Windows. All right, so let me get this done first. Uh, add to compress to, uh, we just want to compress and not email. Okay, let me get, let me get rid of this first. And then right click, save and zip. We just say add to. There we go. This is going to take a while. <clears throat> All right. So today's lecture is there's an outline of today's lecture. If you go to the website and just go to the announcements. So I'm going to follow my own announcement, which is kind of the outline of what I need to talk about today. <clears throat> All right, because today's lab will involve you, you know, kind of tracking or tracing the execution of the program. I want to know the number of times a particular opcode in RAM executes. So you can do it, you know, you, not, you don't have to use SigWin to do this, okay? This is real, real, kind of simple. But, you know, SigWin is going to be useful down the line. So you might want to install SigWin when you're home and then redo the lab for today so that you can get more familiarized with River Spider. It's useful down the line. It's not even useful for, sec for the second exam. So I wouldn't kind of put too much time into this unless you have time. <clears throat> but, you know, it's a, it's a useful resource. All right. So we'll go ahead and do it the long way now. So how do we keep track of a program, you know, and we, we want to run the program and we want to count, you know, or even to know whether a, you know, instruction executes or not. So we'll do it the hard way now. So what it will do is, what I'm going to do is to show you that same file, which is, you know, the same program here, test.ttp ASM. <clears throat> it's a very simple program. It loads... Um, a into, it loads 56 into register A, 39 into register B, it adds B to A, and then it stops, okay? So that's the entire execution of the program. So if I just want to say, I want to make sure that the add instruction happens, okay? I just want to make sure that it does happen, that it executes, how can I verify that in the execution? So that's the question. Does everybody understand what I am about to do? I just want to verify that the add instruction does execute. Yes? Um, sorry? Like? Okay. Repeat the objective. The objective is um, of this program. This program doesn't have a, okay, I'll, I'll make this, you know, make it so that it makes more sense, okay? So we have an add, <clears throat> and we'll do a J, CI to label L1, 
label L1 is over here. I'm going to stash a no op just to be here. Or I can change, change that into a halt instruction like that. Well, OK, I changed my mind again. We'll change this into a no op. And we'll change this into a no op, and then we'll halt. OK, so now there are two no op instructions. I want to know which one executes. First of all, is everybody convinced that one and only one of these no op instructions should execute, or do you think one will always execute? Let me repeat that question. There are two, op, there are two no op instructions in this program. They are on line six and line eight, respectively. The question is, <clears throat> which is there one of is one of these two always going to execute, or do we only execute one or the other, or it is, is it possible that none of these would execute? Yes, go ahead. Oh, hmm. Line oh, line one. That one we don't count because that one ha always has to execute. Sorry, you know, I forgot about this one on line one. That is correct. There's one on line one too, but we are only focusing on line six and line eight. The one on line one we don't even count because that's actually necessary. Yes. <clears throat> that is correct. So if you want to look at this from the C++-ish perspective, I can only say ish because you know, in C or C++, you cannot examine the flags you know, after a instruction. So it would be equivalent to something like, you know, if the C flag is true, um, then you have a go-to to label L1. That is kind of what it would look like in C or C++. <clears throat> so the real question is, after the add instruction, are we going to have the carry flag set or cleared? If the carry flag is set, which means it becomes one, then we are branching to label L1. <clears throat> if not, then we continue with whatever is next to the JCI instruction. So how would you describe the behavior in this particular program you know, based on what we put into register A and what we put into register B. Will the carry flag be set after the add instruction? That's really the first question. Yep. Hmm? So the one on line eight, the no op on line eight, always executes. Because even if we execute, even if we are not branching to label L1, um, then the one on line six will execute. What happens the one on line six executes? Well, it goes to the next available instruction, which is the one on line eight. So the one on line eight always executes. The one on line six, on the other hand, executes if and only if the carry flag is cleared by the time we get to line five. So the real question is, is the carry flag going to be a one or a zero by the time we get to line five? What do you guys think? How much do you remember from binary addition? We are looking at K8, by the way. The C flag, the carry flag, is really the same thing as K8 in binary addition. It would be a zero, very good. And why do, why do you think it's going to be a zero? Mm -hmm. So if I want the carry to become a one, what can I do to change it? That won't do it. OK, so because we're looking at the carry flag, the carry flag is set if and only if what? This is the equivalent to K8. When do we have a carry, like an overall carry from an addition? Yes. When the number is more than 255, that is correct. So if it is exactly 255, we are not having a carry, but if it is more than 255, then we end up with a carry. 
So what you can do is to change the 56 to 200 and my arithmetic is, sucks. 216 or more, I think. 217 or more, sorry. Um, well, I just want the minimum, right? I just want it to barely you know, set the carry flag. So one way to set the carry flag is to change uh, the 56. I'm just going to put a comment here. You know, change to <clears throat> 217 minimum to set the carry flag. Okay, if you know, I'm only going to change you know, uh, the the way register A gets its value. Yes. That is correct because the C flag is the is K eight. So in order for K eight to become a one, okay. So here's a quiz: How is K eight defined based on binary addition? K i plus one equals to C of x i y i or C of Q, I, K, I. Very good. Okay, excellent. Okay, so now that we have established that, okay, I'm going to put it as a comment, you know, at the end of this program. Okay, so K of I plus 1. Okay, I cannot really do subscript here, so I'm going to do square brackets. <clears throat> Technically speaking, you really don't need to write this down because, you know, this you have seen many, many times already. Okay, so technically speaking, this is the general equation. So when i plus 1 is 8, then i is 7. So that means, you know, c of x7, y7, or c of q7, k7. So how do we make that work, right? You know, but there's one little discussion um, in, well, I think, I think it is in when we talk about binary addition, is the carry flag is set if and only if the result cannot be stored in the number of bits that we have allocated. So with seven bits, the range of value that we can actually store is from zero to, mm -hmm. no, we have eight bits, okay? We have eight bits, okay? We have eight bits, so we have eight bit wide, not 16, 255 is the largest unsigned number that we can store in an 8-bit number because the largest value you can store in an 8-bit number is 2 to the power of the number of bits allocated minus 1. So in this case, it is 2 to the power of 8, which is 256, minus 1, which is 255. All right? So this equation is not even... I mean, it is important, but this is not even... Um, totally relevant, you know, in order to figure out, you know, what do we, how do we have to change A in order for the carry flag to become a 1, okay? But I'm not going to change that right now, okay? So I'm going to leave the program as is, and as many of you have already pointed out, the carry flag should be a 0 in this case by the time we get to line 5. So the JCI is not going to branch. Now, how do we know what JCI is going to do? Have we ever talked about the JCI instruction? We actually examined in detail how the JCI instruction works. So that's kind of from last Thursday. And of course, since we have a long you know, three-day weekend, most people cannot remember what we talked about on Thursday, last Thursday. Okay. so. We're going to test run this program. So if you want to test run this program and want to know, so that means, you know, line six is the only question here because the one on line one always executes. It's like at the very beginning. Uh, the one on line eight always executes because that's when the branching merges, okay? The only question is, is the no op on line six going to execute? So how do you find out whether that is going to happen or not? 
So that's the question. So I want you guys to think about this a little bit, and then we'll go ahead and do it. So does anyone have any suggestion of how to test this program to determine whether line six, the no op on line six, is going to execute as it is now? Yes. It is always going to end up on line nine because the halt instruction, that's where we, that's when both branches merge. So we always end up over there. It, if, okay, so there are only two ways to proceed. Either line five goes straight to line eight or line five goes to line six, depending on whether the carry flag is a one or not. Because on last Thursday, we have seen you know, the JCI instruction. If the carry flag is a one, it would use the immediate operand to decide where to go, which means it is going to you know, skip line six and go straight to line eight, if and only if the carry flag is a, is a one. If the carry flag is a zero, it simply increments. So it would just go to whatever is next to the JCI instruction, or, or I should say immediately following the JCI instruction, which is going to be the no op on line six. Is that okay? All right. So today's lecture does you know, connect directly to the lecture on last Thursday. And that is intentional because you know, I want to double check and make sure that you guys understand the instruction and how it works because that's going to be in exam two, which is next Thursday. Okay. So if you're looking at this program and not knowing how to analyze the program, that means you have to review all the material or some of the material from previous lectures. So this is basically just me helping you to assess where you are in class and where you need to, where you might need to spend some time on. All right, so getting back to the experiment. Okay, so now I, you know, get out of this program. <clears throat> and this is something that I only, ha that only I have to do in Linux. You don't have to do this at all. Uh, because I need to put the entire program into the clipboard, and this is how I do it, <clears throat> so that I can go to the assembler. So I go to the assembler, okay, and <laughs> you guys are all here. <laughs> Let me see who that is. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> There's only one person here. Now, by the way, as I work on this program, all of you can be here and make a copy of this spreadsheet just the way it is right now, okay? So this way, you can take a snapshot and just have this, you know, um, copy in your own Google Drive so you can reference it, you can make comments, you can change it any way you want, and so on, okay? So it's, it's a useful tool. <clears throat> all right, so I'm going to do it the long way. So doing the long way means that I have to go to RAM file, Make sure this cell is you know, version 2.0 raw. Go to file, go to download, download as CSV. And you know, it put it into a particular folder. I just call this you know, test.csv, okay? Because it's really just for testing. And now I have the startup logic sim. So logic sim, I will start it up the usual way, okay? So I'm not gonna use any shortcuts. I do, okay, fine, I'm, I'm using a shortcut because I'm Logisim, because I have a little script, you know, to bring up Logisim quicker. <clears throat> but those of you who, who who are using Windows, it's even quicker because you just double click on the file. So I go back and reopen your know, processor zero 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 four, go to RAM, right click, load image, and then I point it to the file that I just saved a little bit earlier. You know, download it, click open. So now I got the file. So running this program at full speed is not going to be helpful, right? So you have a few ways to do this. You can control T, like you know, single click, you know, you know, single click that uh, edge on the clock until it either gets to line six, you know, or line eight. Okay, you you can do that. But if I need you to count the number of times we get to a certain instruction, that would be very tedious to do, and I don't think anyone wants to do it that way for the lab today. So we want to kind of make it easier to kind of keep track of things. 
<clears throat> so the question really, the first question is, where is that no op? Now, in this case, it's pretty obvious, okay? I can look at the RAM content, and I can point to it right now, you know, the no op on line six in the, in the program. So can you guys, like, just write, just look at the RAM content right now and go like, yeah, I know which one it is. So which one is it? Hmm? Zero 08, that is correct. So the no op or the zero zero op code at location zero 08 is indeed the same no op on line six of the program. So the next question is, okay, for those people who figure it out is, how did you figure it out? Yep, you can do the counting. You, you also know the halt instruction is a zero one, and then the two no op instructions are really consecutive to each other because there are no other instructions between the no op instructions. So that means you're looking at two consecutive zeros or zero zeros followed by a zero one right there, okay? And the first of the zero zero is the no op on line six, the second one is the one on line eight. Okay, yep. Line seven is a label. A label does not show up at all when you look at the RAM content. You can look at a label as a feature that is only available to the assembler in order to help it figure out, so which location are we talking about? Oh, that location over there. So it is only used in assemble time but it doesn't show up at all when you're looking at the output, when you're looking at the RAM content. We call these you know, assemble time you know, feature or assemble time language construct because it does not correspond to any memory content when you look at the RAM you know, after the program is fully assembled. No, the, the, the uh, label is, a, is an assembler only thing. So outside of the assembler, it does not exist. That's a very good question. <clears throat> All right, so we are going to switch back to the assembler just for a short amount of time because I want to show you how to make use of the assemble view as well. The assemble tab is really helpful because on one side, on column A, it shows you the source code minus all the comments, so it's kind of clean. On the other hand, with column W, X, and Y, it shows you the exact locations and also what bytes are at those particular locations. So in this particular view, it is pretty clear that on line six, okay, on row six, which is the same as line six, we are at location zero eight and the content at that location is a zero zero. <clears throat> on line eight, we also, at location zero 09, we also have a byte zero zero over here. So this is really helpful when you're trying to debug a program. Do we have any questions about this particular view and how this is corresponding to what we saw in the RAM content in the processor? Because you know, the association between this view and what you see in RAM in here is important. So if you're not making that association right now, okay, that's okay because you, know, there's, you might need some additional time to process this. You might want to jot down in your notes about the current time, which is six o'clock, <clears throat> and also you know, what this is about so that you can you know, kind of review this part of the lecture again if you want to kind of get a clarification or want to process the, that a little bit more. <clears throat> in note-taking techniques, okay, what you also do, would also do is to kind of leave some area in your note uh, so that you know, when you review this portion of the note, you can add your um, additional understanding of the topic in the side area of your note. Um, does everybody understand what I'm talking about? Has, have you guys heard about Cornell notes? 
Okay, I see some nods. Okay, are you guys using it? No? Or a variation of it? Kind of your version of that? Okay, that is important. Okay, so I want to mention that just a little bit. Okay, I know it is not related to assembly language programming, but it is related to taking classes in college in general. So I think it, it's good to know that. So it's called Cornell Note. Okay, I'm pretty sure I got some little typo issue here, but Google can, Google can fix it. So the Cornell note taking system, okay, you know, that's, this is the official one. You can go to this particular website, which is at Cornell University, and read more about it. Or if you want a kind of shortened version and be able to kind of interact and ask about, you know, how to use it, go to ChatGPT. <laughs> this is a legitimate and a productive way to make use of AI. And you can say, how do I um, use Cornell note-taking technique, or what it is, and so on. So it will give you, you know, certain instructions and explain to you, you know, what to do when you're in class, what to do when you're after class, when you're reviewing that stuff, okay? So just some additional information, okay? You don't have to take notes in this class. Um, but I think you know, knowing how to take notes effectively is going to help you not only in this class, but also in all of your other classes. But that's just my view. Is that okay? Are we good with this? Okay. So at least look into some note-taking method and system. Okay. This may not fit the way that you learn. Okay. That's completely understandable. Some people are more visual, they like to draw diagrams and connections, you know, lines and whatnot, then you might want to look into, um, is it called concept map? Okay, so that's another way to kind of make links, association between concepts. Um, it's all, it, you know, there are many ways to do it, but find a way that works for you. All right, so I'm gonna take these tabs out and go back to, oh, Okay, it's, uh, this is the virtual machine. I just have to keep it alive <clears throat> while I work on the other one. Because the other way is much more difficult. You know, this will give you an idea of you know, how difficult it is or how much time you can be saving doing it the other way. But in today's lab, you don't have to. All right, so this is the program. I have downloaded it. It's already loaded into Logisim. Okay, it's already here. I'm ready to run it. So the question is, how do I know whether the no op at location 08, which corresponds to the one on line six in the source code, how do I know whether that one runs or not? If I were to run this at full speed, which I'm gonna do right now, control K, and it goes like this, and you can type control K again to stop the whole thing, I have no idea, okay? Now, some of you can say, well, you can slow down the clock, right? You know, record the whole thing so that, you know, you can you replay the video and see whether it skipped over the one on, you know, at location 06. I suppose that can work too, but it's a very cumbersome mechanism. Yes? Yes, that would be the theoretical way to answer the question, but I want to have a you know kind of empirical way to answer the same question. That's what I'm trying to do. Okay. Oh no, this is not this is not C plus plus. There's no GDB. There's no C out. There's no C in. There's nothing. Okay. So the question is, how do you debug this thing? So when you go to the simulate you know, menu, <clears throat> okay, of all of these entries, which one do you think can help you? Take ones is going to, take ones is the same thing as control T, which means you know, you're, it might take you a while to get there. So the answer is logging, okay? So Logisim has the ability to log stuff. So let's go to logging and find out what Logisim can log. 
So the window opened up in my other monitor. I just have to bring it to view first, like that. Okay. So when you look at selection, those are the things that you can log. Lots of stuff. Okay. The question is which one is the one that you want to log. Okay. So there are a few things here that seem to be relevant. Um, a, by the way, is the A port of RAM. B is the D port of RAM. Um, there, there's a whole bunch of stuff, you know, you know, everything that looks like a circle, you know, that's an output pin. Um, and when you look at something that looks like a square, that's a register. In other words, you can log the change of a register, or you can, you can log the change of an output pin. The way Logistream works is if there is a change to something that you're logging, it creates a new log entry. But if nothing is changing to the thing that you're, you're logging, then it won't create a single line of log in the log file. So you're looking for something that changes, okay? Lots of stuff changes in this case. Op fetch is an output pin that is the one when we are fetching. But it doesn't tell you what it is fetching or where it's fetching from. So by itself, it's useless. I mean, do you, will, will you end up logging a lot of things? Yes. Is it going to be useful? No. So uh, you can also log some other things that seems to be related to what we are doing. For instance, you can try to log the instruction register because you might say, okay, the instruction register is going to be changed, okay, right? And you know, uh, we know the opcode that we are fetching that, would, that we should pay attention to, but remember, we got two of them. So when you just log the instruction register, it doesn't tell you which no op we are talking about. It can be the one on line one, the one on line six, or the one on line eight. Now, in this particular case, you can just say, well, but I can count, right? You know, if, it's, you know, if there are two entries, that means the one on line six did not execute because the execution of the no op on line one and line eight is mandatory. So that means I'm looking at either two or three of those instances. Yes, okay, so in this particular program, in this particular scenario, you can use that to help you. But in general, it's not a very good method when you, can, when you have to analyze the code and say, well, you know, we can either execute this code or not execute this code. But it won't help you when you need to count the number of times you execute a particular line of code. So that by itself is not useful. Can someone tell me which register, let me see whether it's in view. Yep, it is in view right now. Which register will tell you which is unique to a particular opcode in RAM? Yes, the program counter. Very good, okay? The program counter is unique to each instruction in RAM. So that's why it is a useful item to track because the program counter uh, will tell you, I mean, if you log just the program counter, then you know, the, it will give you an entry every single time the program counter changes. So the question is, is that gonna help us in this case? The answer is, not by itself, okay? So we'll, we'll go ahead and log it and see what happens. So I'm gonna log the PC. Either one works, okay? You know, because this is the register and this is the output pin, which is straight out of the of the register, so they are really the same thing. So you can pick one or the other. So we'll take this, we add it to this side. This dash two means it is logging in binary, in base two. Well, unless you really want to practice your hexadecimal to base two conversion mentally, you know, you can probably change the radex so that it's base 16, okay? Just a recommendation, but for people who want to do everything in binary, that's perfectly okay too. So once we have, so you can you can select additional items to log if you want to. So, but I'm just want I just want to focus on the PC right now, and see whether that helps us or not. Um, then you can choose one of two ways to log. You can choose to log things in a table that is built into Logisim, meaning everything is going to be visualized here, or you can log it to a file. My recommendation for at least the lab is to log it to a file. The reason why, you can why I want you to log it to a file is it creates just a plain text file, like 
something that Notepad can open, okay? So if it logs to a file, that means you can keep different files for different scenarios, and then you can use an editor to kind of count the number of times you see a particular number. So that's gonna be helpful, yes? That's table. Yeah, so the table option would do that. The file option would log it to a file. But my recommendation is to log it to a file. You, you can definitely select which way you want to do it. So I'll log it to a file. The way you start to log it to a file is you can see the enable button is grayed out because I haven't specified a file. So you have to go to select and then just you'll give it the file name in a folder. But you want to remember the name of the file as well as where it is. So I'm gonna put it into my temp folder. In Windows, you probably just want to keep it in the documents folder or just the home folder. So I would call this the test.log. The extension is not important, okay? At least in Linux, the extension is not important at all. But in Windows, you might want to call it textlog.txt or something like that so that Notepad you know, can open it, you know, can identify that file easily and just open it. But that's up to you. So we give it the file name, we click save, there we go. So at this point, it's enabled, okay? You can see, you know, in order to stop it, you have to disable it. So now you can, you can actually close this window by now. We have configured the logger already, so we can close this. So now we make sure that everything is reset, okay? We are starting at location zero, the program is still here, clock is low, okay? Because all of these conditions are important because I need to make sure that the entire thing is reset to where I need it to be. So if I type control T right now, it will start the clocking, okay, just like before. Control T and oh, I guess not control K, sorry. So it's done, okay? How do, how I know it is done is because the halt pin is a one. When the halt pin becomes a one, the program is done already. So now I can type control K again just to stop all the clocking. And then I can now go to the file, okay? I can do it on the command line. You don't have to do it on the command line, but you know, just because I kind of, I'm used to using the command line. So now I can go here and look at the same file. And you can see the, you know, how PC changed over time. At the reset state, it is at location zero, zero. We kind of know that. And this is the entire path of the, the PC, the program counter. So the question is, does that make sense to you? The, in order to know whether this makes sense to you, it is helpful to also bring up the assemble tab of the assembler. So we'll go ahead and take a look at that one right here. And also, you'll put this side by side like so. Okay. So does it make sense? Well, starting at location zero, zero, makes sense. Um, the PC is not skipping location zero one, um, or zero two, I should say. It's not skipping location zero two, which is the three eight. Can someone remind me, you know, why do we have a three eight here at location zero two? Yes. Yep, that's the immediate value, right? That's the immediate operand, which is the value that we're putting into register A. So the 3.8 is really the 5.6, okay? 3.8 is in hexadecimal, 5.6 is in base 10. 3 times 16 is 48, 48 plus 8 is 56, checks out, okay? So the PC just kind of increments you know, like this, and you're looking for um, something being skipped, right? Because remember what I said? We are looking um, for evidence that we skipped the execution of the no op on line six, uh, which has location zero eight. So location zero eight appears here. In other words, the program counter did change to location zero eight, even though the no op did not execute. Why? Yes. Nope, nope, it, this has to do with the JCI instruction. So what, the, what does the JCI instruction do to the program counter when whatever flag we're looking for is a zero? It jumps, no, it does not jump, but in this case, it does not jump, um, and that's why, you know, okay. So in this case, you know, 
it makes sense, okay? So the location 0, 6 did, we visited that location. So if you want to confirm, double confirm it and make sure that we fetched from that location, you can also add another thing to the logger. So let me go back to LogiSim. So we go back to the logger or logging, and we go back to the selection. So if you combine the PC, which is a program counter, with um, the fetch, okay, where is fetch? Oops, it's right before that. So add the fetch thing here. Now it's going to be much more helpful because now every time you only look at OP fetch being a one and the program counter, that means we are fetching from that specific location. It's not just because of the auto increment, it's because we actually fetched from that location. So we'll go ahead and log again. Now this is also important. If you change the way of what you're logging or want to restart the entire log, if you don't do a single thing, it will append the new log at the end of the older log, which may or may not, probably not what you're looking for. So if you want to restart the entire log, there are two ways to do it, but they're basically the same way. You basically want to reselect the same file. You can still log to the same file, but you have to save it again, at which point LogiSim will go like, okay, you just re-specified the same log file. And it will ask you, do you want to overwrite? Which means you know, you, it will first erase the current log file and then start from scratch. Or do you want to append to the file that is already existing? Most likely, you want to overwrite, okay? If you do not do this step, if you do not re-specify the log file, it automatically appends, which can create problems for the lab today. So specify, overwrite. All right, so we're going to overwrite like so. Close the window. And now we can make sure the clock is low first. OK, I think it is low. Yep. And then I can click the reset button up here to reset everything except for RAM, because I don't, have, I don't want to reload you know, the content of the program. Yes? So I'll show you the log. It'll, it'll be obvious when we see it. Yep. It only logs to the file in that case. So if you want to log to the table, then you have to disable the file logging. But personally, for the lab today, because it's going to be lengthy, uh, logging it to a file and be able, being able to use Control F to search in the file is going to be helpful. It's just a time saver for you. Yep. Yep. Opfetch is a single bit output pin, so it wouldn't matter. Yep. But for anything that is a bit wide, I would say I would use a base 16. You know, just because the assembler itself uses your base 16 for everything. Yep. What is the what? Location zero, zero again, B, B, in the log file. Well, that's the location after the halt instruction. Okay, so that's a good question to ask. I see why you're asking that question. So why do you think the program counter changed to location zero B when the halt instruction is in lo at location zero A? It goes back to the execution cycle. Yes. Nope, it has, it's not because of the loop. Yes. Because the program counter auto increments right after the fetch and before the execute. So we have already talked about all of these things. Okay, so if, you, if you're thinking, okay, I don't understand why, okay, that means you, know, you have to revisit the details of how instructions execute in the processor. Because all of these things have been touched you know, in previous lectures already. 
but there, there are a lot of details, okay? But everything is in the processor itself. So when you are going through the motion or the exercise of single clocking, you have to pay attention to all of those details. And it really helps if you're writing down notes at the same time, okay? That, that should also help. All right, so we are ready to retrace the entire program. So I'm gonna type Control K on the keyboard, which basically just starts the auto click you know, mechanism. Now it is done. We stop the whole, the whole thing, and then we go back to revisit the file. Okay, so we go back to this thing here. Okay, this is still looking at the old file. Um, actually, it updates itself. Cool, creepy, but cool. Okay, so <laughs> the file content changed, you know, but I, I don't remember reloading the file, but it reloaded itself. So all the lines with a one on the column of OP fetch are fetch operations. In other words, you can ignore every single line that has OP fetch being a zero because you know, yeah, the program counter changed to that line, but we didn't fetch from that location. And you can see certain locations are quote unquote skipped. Um, they were never fetched. I can point out you know, which one locations. Uh, look, 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 at, look at location zero two. Location zero two was quote unquote visited by the program counter, but I never fetched from that location. Why? Because that's the immediate value. The opcode, which is the byte before at location zero one, that one was fetched right here. But the one after is the immediate value, so we didn't fetch you know, that thing because it was not an opcode. So now it is clear that the no op at location 06 was indeed fetched. So this is confirmation that we executed the no op at location 06. Yes? Are you logging both the program counter and op fetch? Did you reset the processor to start from the beginning? You did a, you press the reset button? The reset button in the circuit itself, not the control R. The control R would also erase RAM, which is kind of what I was trying to avoid doing. But you, ha you have to click the, the reset button at the top of the circuit diagram, because that will reset all the registers including the program counter. Because what you're seeing is the program counter not being reset, so you're continuing the tracing when you're already at a halt instruction, and that's why you only logged one single PC, which is you know, at a halt, which is the program counter after the halt instruction, and that's why you only see zero B. Is that okay? All right. Oh, one more thing to confirm is we also want to make sure that zero B is not fetched. And you can see how 0B, the program counter changed to 0B, but we did not fetch from 0B. Because it changed to 0B simply because there's an auto increment after the fetch phase of executing instruction. But after that, when we get to the quote unquote execute phase of the halt instruction, then it's stuck. So it never went back to another fetch to fetch from location 0B. Is that okay so far? Okay, so program counter, OP fetch together is super helpful. Are we good so far? Okay. Now, this file format is not a CSV because it's not a comma separated value file. This is a TSV, it's a tab separated value file. So, for those of you who know how to use the regular expression, um, and stuff like that, you can actually get rid of all the lines that are not relevant to you. Um, does anyone want to see how that is done in VI? Okay. So in VI, you can specify you know, a range of line. So in this case, it's one line from line one to, um, actually, hmm, to the end of file. Okay, dollar sign is the end of file. <clears throat> so there are a few things you can do. You can do the erase, um, but in this case, I'm just going to use substitute. So substitute can, can allow you to specify. In this case, it's not too hard to specify. I'm not going to 
make it too fancy because we only have one tab character. So we want we are looking for the tab character, and then followed by a zero. So um, in BI or NeoVim, it automatically highlights everything that matches the search criteria. So this is how it specifies. It's like, okay, I can find all of these things. So if you want to erase those files, okay, depending on what you want to do, you can erase. So if you want to erase all of those those lines, you can do a slash, and then do the same thing: dash t backslash t, um, and then a digit which is a zero, and then followed by a d. I think that works. I'm not 100% sure. Um, nope, it does a search. I think it only erases one line. So that means I have to find, I have to specify the range of lines, do the same thing, and then specify a D to delete. And I cannot remember how to do the delete. I think maybe I have to start with the D first. Something like that. Hmm. All right. I'm I'm giving up, <clears throat> we will do a search here, how to delete lines by search in VI. <clears throat> Removing all lines containing a string in VI. All right. Okay, I forgot to specify G first. Okay, so that that's why it didn't work. Okay, so G slash backslash T zero slash D. There we go. It looks a lot cleaner now. All right, now obviously this is just you know, kind of fancy stuff, you know, icing on the cake. You don't have to do it this way, you know, regular notepad, you just search for lines where OP fetches a one and the PC at the address that you're looking for. Yes? Um, not yet, because I haven't saved the edited you know, buffer. So right now I'm only doing stuff to the buffer. So until I do a colon W to save the file, um, the file itself is not touched. Okay, all right. So this is kind of important for today's lab, okay? Because you know, I think all of you should do this. Um, are there any questions about the concepts, the process? No questions? Okay, well, whenever you have questions, you'll just go ahead and ask. Um, all right, so we cover the CLI method. So that's part is done. Um, River Spider, you know, I don't think you want to set it up today. Uh, even though the process is relatively simple, you know, you just, oh, I have to remember to do one thing. I have to remember to upload, re-upload the one that I have fixed. I hope it's still there somewhere. Yep, still there, that's nice. Because I have to re-upload this one. You know, this one just has a few things fixed, so I'm gonna have to re-upload it into Google Drive. So here we go. Oh, I forgot to sign in first. Okay. Ah, you guys can see all my password. Fortunately, I didn't finish the entire thing. That's my WID. Okay. Oh, not again. All righty, so we go to processor. I just need to re-upload the file so that you guys get the one that is fixed. That's also why I was a little bit late today because I was in my office and you're trying to fix up a few things. So we go to downloads, save and Z, open, replace, there we go. Okay, so that's all we need to do on this browser. All right. 
Right. OK, so that's done. Let me go back to the announcement for today. Because you know, this part here, for the most part, is really how you can study. OK, because I, before I get to exam two, which we may not have, may or may not have some time, I want to point out the scope of the exam. It's going to include you know, all the instructions that are listed here. Some we visited you know, in detail, because I just went through the execution. I tracked down how things are connected with the one in bold face. So that means you know, if you don't remember, you can watch the videos of the recording of the class again. We talked about JMPI, JCI on last Thursday. We talked about LDI and LD, I think the, day, the, the class before that one, which is last Tuesday. And then on the Tuesday, on the Thursday before that, we also talked about the ad instruction. The CMP instruction was talked about when we talked about JMPI and JCI, which, is, which was last Thursday. The rest, I haven't really talked about in detail, but they are very similar to the ones that we have already talked about, so they don't really need to be talked about. The ones that are a little bit special that you should probably really look into are increment, decrement, and CPR, because they differ a little bit from the rest of that family, but yet, eh, I mean, CPR is easier to understand compared to LD or LDI or ST, because CPR copies from one register to another register. It doesn't use RAM at all. So it's a really easy one, but you should go through that one yourself, okay? So go through you know, the CPR instruction the same way that I explained the LDI and the LD instruction so that you understand how the pathway is established between two registers. How do you copy from one register to another register? Okay, that's the CPR instruction. Um, and then the increment and decrement instructions are also italic, which means you, know, you want to be able to examine those instructions. Because unlike the other instructions, okay, if you look at add, subtract, and, or, not, and right shift, and compare, they all change the flags register. Increment and decrement do not. So you might want to look into that one and say, huh, how can they not change the flags register when the addition is really happening in the ALU? And by the way, how does it know that we are adding one to a register? Because if we, don't, if we don't have increment and decrement, then you have to load one into one of the other registers and then add those two registers. It can be done, but it's a lot of hassle. Increment and decrement are really nice little shortcuts so that we don't have to waste another register just to increment a particular register. It also intentionally does not touch the flex register. Yes? No, no, they use the ALU. <laughs> they use the ALU. Um, so I will give you a clue. Okay, so let's go back to the diagram here. So the diagram here, if you look at the diagram, um, the enable of the flex register, which is this particular wire, is not coming straight out of the ROM. So it is not directly specified by the ROM. Instead, it's coming from FC, flex control, okay? So flag control is up here. It is the NAND between R01D MUX and ALUEN. So in order for FC to be zero, we need both of these to be ones. ALUEN being one, we kind of understand, okay, we want to use the ALU, we want to enable the ALU. We got that one. Register output one D MUX also needs to be a one in order for FC to be a zero. So register output one DMUX is this wire here. It selects the you know, what output we send this out one to. So if this thing is a one, it's going to use this one over here. Um, and hmm, that doesn't seem to make sense. Okay, we want FC to be a zero. Oh, it is. Okay, but then we also do a NOT gate over here. Oh, that, would, that is really dumb of me. Hey, at least I'm one of those stupid people who knows I'm stupid. I may not be the stupidest or most stupid person. 
Okay, if you remember that discussion, that, that's good. That means you actually paid attention to all the things that are not related to assembly language programming. If you don't remember, that's okay. You don't have to watch that again. Anyway, why do you think I said I was dumb? Yes, <laughs> I, I, could, I could have just made this a regular AND gate and get rid of this NOT gate over here because I ju I'm just double negating it. Yep, but it works the way it is, so I'm gonna leave it as is. I don't wanna make any changes right now. So in order for this to be a zero, and this is an AND gate, so I need at least one of these two to be a zero, which also means, you know, uh, when A-L-U-E-N is a, is a one, then I can afford to have register output one DMUX to be a zero. That means you know, the output from this register bank is not going to the ALU. Then it will select the other way. Oh, I need that negation. Because you know, one of these two things, uh, okay, I can rearrange things so that I don't need it. But anyway, it will select this zero one to become into when this MUX has a select of one and that's you know that's how it works so anyway this is what you need to examine okay you know is how does increment and decrement work okay so that you have to do it by yourself it will touch on certain things that i have not talked about in class but if you understand the you know the logic gates if you understand how the registers work then you should be able to figure that out okay so that's something that you have to do. All right, so getting back to the scope of the exam when it comes to the instructions. All right, so computationally, so that's how you, we read this, you know, these three categories. Um, you know, okay, technically we also have your know, halt and no op, but those are not super exciting instructions. So I'm not even gonna mention those. Um, operands, you know, we have been using those you know, already. You know, it's just that I never really talk about the operands or the type of the operands. All the numbers are immediate. So L the second one in LDI is an immediate. JMPI has an immediate. Everything that has an I has an immediate. Uh, registers are the ones you know, from A to D, but without parentheses around the registers. So we are only talking about the value of the register. That is the value, either providing to change something else or being changed. The indirect are the ones here with parentheses. Uh, basically, we are dereferencing in those cases. There are only two instructions that would use in the indirect addressing mode or the indirect operands. Can someone name those two instructions, the mnemonics? In other words, this is the only way we change or read the content of RAM. Which two instructions would either read from RAM or overwrite location, a location in RAM? Hmm? Load is one. Mm -hmm. And store, very good. Okay, so LD and ST are the only two instructions that make use of the indirect operand because only those two has one of the registers in parentheses. Okay, all right. Whenever you see a register in parentheses, it means you know, that register would connect to the A port of RAM and therefore, the, you know, change, therefore determining which location in RAM we are changing or, up or reading. All right. Um, yeah, that's it. Okay, that's all we. That's all I have planned for today. Okay, so now we go back to the demonstration. Okay, let's. I'm gonna take row first still, and then we'll we'll go back to the demonstration. So I do have the row thing set up. You guys can go to Canvas first, and I'm gonna unhide today's. Road taking activity. It is right here. You know, it's right after how to study the TTP. And the access code is processor. Very exciting word. <clears throat> Particularly if you are Jensen Huang, then that word is super exciting because you know that's the reason why NVIDIA becomes a two plus trillion dollar company.
So let me know if you guys have any problems getting to the road taking activity. Yep. Tonight? There's only one lap. Yo, the the lap that we're gonna do today, I, I'll I'll unhide it and you guys will see it. I'm not sure how many of you, tr you know, kind of keep track of your know, Jensen Huang. I don't, you know, but apparently Google thinks that I do. So it sends me all the feeds, you know, about your know, Jensen Huang and what he is, what he has been saying. Yes. You mean like a breakpoint? Yeah. Oh, because it has something better. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is the other part of what I wanted to demonstrate. So if you go to the assembler right now, and if you go to analysis, um, nope, it did not uh, save that one. Okay, so let me let me run it from this command line first. All right, so quit and I go to my documents CISP 310 go to reefer spider okay so this is the very same TTP ASM you know the same source file that I have been talking about today so now you know it's all done and now if you you know if you already have the assembler open you can go to the analysis tab look at this it shows us exactly where each opcode is, what line it is on, and what is on that line. So if it skips a location, it would actually skip it. It won't appear here. So it would. this one confirms that location uh, line six, location six, location six, okay? This is location six, which is corresponding to the JCI instruction. It executes, and right after that, we executed the no op on line six. So it confirms that we ran the no op on line six. It's clear, right? You don't have to count. You don't have to do your own lookup of you know, what location we are tracking because it shows you line numbers, okay? You know, that's the nice thing is it shows you everything in source form. You don't have to do your own, oh, I need to look at the assemble tab, figure out what location I'm tracking, and you know, count the number of times. And by the way, what is at that location? This shows you everything. That is why it doesn't have a breakpoint. It doesn't need a breakpoint because it tracks the entire execution of a program in the form of a spreadsheet. Yes? So, I noticed that it did not get a data execution on line six. Uh, did it or did it not? It did. In this case, it did. So, this confirms that we ran the no op on line six because. Um, the carry flag was a zero. Now, how do we know the carry flag is a zero? When we perform the add instruction, it even tells you what happened to each one of the flags. It doesn't even you know, require you to remember, oh, bit zero is the carry flag, bit one is the sign flag, oh, oh, is it a zero flag? It don't have to remember a single thing. It decodes, you, decodes it for you. The carry flag became zero, the zero flag became zero, the sign flag became zero, the O flag became zero, and the L flag became zero because of the add instruction. It does it all for you. Yes? So the well, you won't have enough time today to set up um, River Spider because it does take quite a bit of time to set it up. Um, it's a one, it's, it's, you have to decompress to what is equivalent to about 1.3 gigabytes of file. So by today's standard, it is nothing, right? But to do it on a thumb drive, it's going to take a long time, especially when your thumb drive costs less than, what, five bucks. Because those things are super slow, it will take you like half an hour to do it. So we won't have enough time to, today to use River Spider. And there are a few other things that you have also have to do. You kind of have to read the instructions a little bit. So that's why I don't want, you know, I don't think there's enough time to use River Spider. Um, okay, there's an alternative to make this work. Okay, so I'm gonna show you the alternative 
just so that you guys know what other way you can use to make the same thing happen. Okay, so let's take, yeah, we've got five minutes. We, we got enough time. Okay, so the other way to do this is not to run LogiSim in GUI mode. So we get out of GUI mode <clears throat> and then we go to the command line. So what we need to do in that case is to run LogiSim on in the command, command line mode. So that means you have to remember how to specify paths in whatever operating system you're using. So in this case, I have to specify first uh, the Logisim uh, file. So Logisim, oh, okay, it's not there. Let's go to processor, Logisim 310. Okay, so that starts Logisim. And then we have to specify the processor 0004 path. So that is, to me, it is, okay, over here in CISB 310 inside documents. Oh, I'm already in documents inside processor. And this is processor 0004.circ. And then after that, you have to specify where do I find the file to load the content into RAM. So with that one, you have to specify dash load, and then you specify that path, which is in the temp folder, in my case, test.csv. And then after that, you have to, oh, this is assuming that you remember to download you know, uh, test.csv and go through all that stuff with the assembler first. And then you specify dash tty table. You might remember dash tty table from the earlier you know, labs you know, for this class. And then you redirect this to a file, which is the log file. So I'm gonna redirect this to tmp.slash.tst test.tsv, which is tab separated file. Okay, done. Then, <laughs> this is like half of it. The other half is to go to trace raw data tab, go to file, go to import, go to upload, go to browse, find that file, which is right here, okay? Then you have to remember all of these, okay? Do not do anything other than replace current sheet and turn off auto detect and make sure it's tab. And then uncheck, convert text to numbers and dates and formula. Then you import the data. Might take a little bit of time. Okay, then you go back to the analysis tab. You basically get the same thing, except it has a lot of empty rows. Um, this has to do with the upload process of River Spider did some filtering already. This way does not do the same filtering. So that's why it does work. <laughs> but I would say River Spider can save you a little bit of time. I mean, before I wrote River Spider, I also do it the, the other way, like this way, you know, like all the time. It's just that one day I decided, ah, this is like super tedious. I don't have, I don't want to have to do this. And I also got the itch to write some pro, some code. So I just wrote, you know, River Spider, which is just a sh shell script along with some other stuff. So anyway, you do not, okay, I repeat, you do not need to use your know, River Spider. It's cool to use it, but you don't have to because if you just track you know, the program counter and the OP fetch, op fetch, you know, um, those two columns, you'll be fine. You still don't want to go just yet because I need to, you need to know the access code to the lab. So let me find that. All right, so today's lab is called Simple Branching and Code Analysis, which kind of goes back to you know, how to use the JCI, JSI, that sort of instruction. <clears throat> Let me unhide it right now, and then we show, I show you the access key. It's called JOY, J-O-Y, because we also have an instruction called JOY is J-O-I. That's, that's why. Jump if and only if the overflow is set immediate, joy. All right, I'll see you guys at the lab in just a little bit. <laughs>